Hi there, this is day two of lesson 15 on epics and legends. So let's get at it here. In a galaxy far, far away, in a time long, long ago. Well, I'm afraid I'm dating myself by saying those words, but I remember when the first Star Wars movie came out in theaters. Hundreds of people stood in long lines so that they could see this new science fiction movie and watch the forces of darkness battle with the forces of light. The movie rocked the box office in sales and rocked the movie industry, also in the area of special effects. Although we won't be discussing some of those things in this week's lessons, we'll take a look at possibly the reasons why Star Wars drew such a following. Yes, the special effects were revolutionary for the time and the music and soundtrack were incredible. And many a band class I think has played them uh, or piano lesson um, book has them in it too. The acting was great, but there was something else. What was at the core of this movie's success? Um, and interestingly enough, I think there's another Star Wars movie coming out right away here. So it has been very, very long lasting, the, the popularity and success. So I'd say that the reasons include these things, why it was so successful and why its popularity continues to this day. You have a battle between good and evil. You have a hero and a villain. You have a conflict that spans years of time or a pretty extensive amount of time. And you have supernatural forces at work for both good and evil. So sounds like an epic tale to me. So let's learn a little bit more about what an epic tale is and apply this new knowledge to our decision concerning Star Wars, although I've kind of let you in on it already, haven't I? So if you look at Webster's Dictionary, and I like Miriam Webster, it defines an epic as a long narrative poem in an elevated style recounting the deeds of a legendary or historical hero. So remember from last week, an epic is not always a poem. It's often a poem, but not always. Some literature books define an epic tale by listing four traditional qualities. They say it's about a great national hero. So the hero is of national or international importance. It's written in lofty language. That would be number two. So kind of uh, sounds important, right? It's an elevated or grand style. Three, it contains supernatural elements. So supernatural forces may intervene at times. And number four, it explores a struggle of good and evil. So it includes deeds of great valor or courage. So last week you had notes about an epic that also included that the setting is vast, covering large areas or distances, and the deeds of a hero are usually count, recounted with objectivity. So it's told um, not with opinion infused into it, if that makes sense to you. So an epic, we said is a long narrative poem based on a series of heroic adventures that are important to the advancement of a certain race or country. So you can see how this definition fits the stories we're talking about this week, even if they're not all poems. So there's two kinds of epics as well as all the um, uh, qualities that epics have. So there's a primary epic. So in a primary epic, writers would tie together all the oral myths and traditions of a culture into a single heroic story. So the oldest primary epic is Gilgamesh, which was written around 3000 years before um, Christ in Mesopotamia. Gilgamesh is uneven and survives only in fragments. So most studies of the heroic epic begin with the Iliad and the Odyssey which were both written around 700 to 900 to 750 BCE by the Greek poet Homer. Other famous epics include the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, and Mort Arthur, which you looked at yesterday. So a secondary epic is writers that create stories in the style of an epic based entirely on their own imaginations rather than an oral history. So famous secondary epics include Virgil's Adonide, Dante's Allegra's Divine Comedy, and Milton's Paradise Lost. So Star Wars and the Lord of the Rings. So that's the two that we wanna talk about today. The epic continues. 
So Star Wars is widely viewed as a modern epic. It contains many of the elements of a classic epic. It chronicles the adventures of a hero, vividly describes the battle between good and evil, and it reflects the values of culture. So, influenced by heroes of epics and legends that he knew about, George Lucas set a traditional hero tale in a futuristic setting. In Star Wars, The Emperor Strikes Back, The Return of the Jedi, Lucas traces the adventures of Luke Skywalker, and he draws on the traditional stages in the life of a hero. In addition, he pits youthful Skywalker against the experienced Darth Vader, and the conflict between the small rebel force and the powerful empire are examples of the battle between the underdog and the bully. Like other epic heroes, Starwalker has his weaknesses as well as his strengths. As a hero matures, he has to overcome the fears and disadvantages that come with beginning as an ordinary human being. The origin of the hero is frequently marked by an unusual circumstance, such as Arthur's pulling the sword Excalibur from the stone. Skywalker, raised by foster parents, is ignorant of his true heritage. So like other epic heroes, Skywalker is not alone on his journey. So it so he has some trustworthy worthy friends, Han Solo, Princess Leia, Chewbacca, C-3PO, R2-D2, and Skywalker receives the gifts of the Force and his lightsaber from his spiritual guide, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Is this like Merlin and King Arthur? Hmm. As often happens in epics, Skywalker is separated from his companions. As a lone hero, he must seek out a spiritual teacher or mentor on a long journey or quest. So when he returns, he's prepared to confront the forces and temptations that would defeat an ordinary man. Therefore, when he confronts Darth Vader, who is both an enemy and father, Skywalker is strong enough to suffer serious injury rather than give up the struggle for his cause. Uh, mythic structure is universal. Myth itself is kept fresh through interpretation, is a quote by Joseph Campbell. So every generation kind of has to recontextualize the myth to suit their times or create their own roadmap as to how to live it well. So he suggested that the scarcity of modern myth is an incalculable lost, incalculable, I can't say that word, lost to our culture, meaning that like it's really important that we have um, modern myths and epics and legends. So after the release of Star Wars, Campbell and Lucas became friends and Campbell credited Lucas with reinvigorating the mythic force in the modern world. In return, Lucas reignited worldwide interest in Campbell's ideas, which have had profound repercussions in Hollywood in particular, and the world culture in general. The symbiosis with a primary mentor figure must have been a great moment for Lucas. Lucas even called Campbell my Yoda. So one of the Campbell's messages is that mythic structure is more than an underlying archetype of a good story. Myth teaches us how to live well. If George Lucas were to create a mythic map of his life, it might look like this. And so you have a chart in your notes. I don't know if I'll go through it all. Um, so the archetype is a hero and the hero in Star Wars is Luke. And then in Lucas's life, he was nicknamed Luke in high school. Um, Mentors. So Obi-Wan Kenobi was the mentor in Star Wars, but in Lucas's life, it was Joseph Campbell. A mentor's mentor in Star Wars is Yoda. In Lucas's life, it is Henrik Zimmer, who Joseph Campbell studied under. Um, Near-death experience. In Star Wars, it's the trash compactor monster. And in Lucas's life, he had a near-fatal car crash in high school which made him suddenly aware of his own mortality and there's more notes there uh, temptation in star wars is the dark side and in lucas's life he had um, after the success of american graffiti he was strongly pressured to repeat that success formula rather than go with something different and atypical like star wars and a boon is destroying the Death Star. And so for Lucas, that was the Star Wars trilogy. Um, 
A hero's reward is a magic elixir. The hero completes its journey, journey by sharing this boon with his tribe, making the world a little bit better. Okay, so let's move on to Lord of the Rings. When J.R.R. Tolkien was a child, he heard the other kids in the, his neighborhood speaking a made-up language called Animalic. Tolkien contributed to the neighbor's next imaginary, Nevbosh, or New Nonsense, and this fascination with languages became a lifelong obsession for Tolkien, eventually leading to a position as Merton Professor of English Language and Literature at Oxford, concentrating on philology. Tolkien spent most of his friend time, free time inventing fairy languages. Quenya is reminiscent of Finnish, Sindarin of Welsh. As he crafted these languages, Tolkien had a singular revelation. For a language to be real, it has to consistently reflect a cultural perspective, the story of a culture. In other words, a real language both implies and demands a myth. So then he wrote The Hobbit and published it in 1936 and Lord of the Rings in 1948. So both were written to service Tolkien's imaginary languages and he was frustrated that most people assumed the reverse. In an article explaining his obsession called A Secret Vice, Tolkien wrote, the making of language and mythology are related functions. Your language construction will breed a mythology. So Tolkien's work was modestly successful in academic circles for over a decade. Professors and students were reluctant to admit how much they loved a story about a silly elf and dragon stuff. And it wasn't until an American publisher illegally published a cheap edition in paperback that Tolkien's work finally reached the mainstream. By mid 60s, The Lord of the Rings was probably the most highly regarded and influential fantasy story in the Western world, occupying the same position as Star Wars does today. Um, the Lord of the Rings has made a remarkable comeback in popularity with the release of movies about it. And Lucas has often cited Lord of the Rings as a major influence on Star Wars. So here's some similarities. Yoda is similar to Gollum, lightsabers to magic swords, Obi-Wan Kenobi to Gandalf, Princess Leia to Galadriel, Darth Vader to Sar Saruman or the Black Rider, Emperor Palpatine to Sauron, Obi digging Anakin's lightsaber out of the old wooden box and giving it to Luke, um, similar to Bilbo, digging his magic sword out of a wooden box and giving it to Frodo. In Star Wars, Darth cuts off Luke's hand, which plunges into the abyss with Luke's lightsaber. In Lord of the Rings, Gollum bites off Frodo's finger, which plunges into the abyss with the One Ring. Yoda foretells the future and Luke must decide whether to help his friends or not. Yoda warns that he's seen the only one possible future. And Galadriel foretells the future and Sam must decide whether to help his friends or not. Galadriel warns she's seen the only one possible future. Darth tries to convince Luke to join him on the dark side. Or join the dark side, thereby bringing order to the galaxy. In Lord of the Rings, Saruman tries to convince Gandalf to join the evil wizards, thereby... Um, bringing order to Middle Earth, sorry. Um, there is a mundane name and a special name in Ben and Obi-Wan in Star Wars. In Lord of the Rings, mundane names, special names are Strider and Aragorn. There's a mysterious figure that throws back the hood of the robe to reveal he's Obi-Wan in Star Wars. And in Lord of the Rings, there's a mysterious figure that throws back the hood of the robe to reveal that he's Gandalf. Luke says, I shouldn't have come. I'm endangering the mission because Darth consents him. And in Lord of the Rings, Glorfindel says, it is you Fro Frodo and that which you bear that brings us into peril because Sauron consents the one ring. In Star Wars, Obi-Wan duels with Darth Vader using blue and red lightsabers. <clears throat> And Gandalf duels with a Balrag using blue and red flaming magic swords in Lord of the Rings. 
Skywalker is not alone in his journey. Han Solo, Princess Leia, Chewbacca, CP3, C3PO, and RD2, R2D2 are in um, Star Wars along with Skywalker. And in Lord of the Rings, Frodo is not alone on his journey, the Fellowship of the Ring. Okay, so for review for lessons 14 and 15 for your quiz or your open book quiz tomorrow, review legends, their definition, purpose, and examples. I'll be able to define parody and give examples of it, especially in, um, okay, my mind is just drawing a total blank here. In, um, 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 um. Don Quixote. That's what we're trying to say. Make sure you understand what gerunds are and be able to identify examples and parts of speech that the gerund is standing in for. Um, know who Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra was, his dates of baptism and death, and a bit of his history. Make sure you know the characters in Don Quixote, their names and descriptions, symbols and themes. Make sure you know when Alfred Lord Tennyson was born and died what some of his names of his poems were and the purpose for writing about Arthur. Mort Arthur, know the plot and know a little bit about um, epics as well, the two types of epics and some about Star Wars, the creator who it was and the parallels to King Arthur's legend and parallels to the Lord of the Rings. And kind of same thing for Lord of the Rings creators and then the parallels there as well. Okay, so that um, goes over what will be on your open book test tomorrow. There'll be short answer questions. You'll have to write a paragraph for the last question of the open book quiz. All right, so that concludes our study of epics and legends. And next week, you will start working on the alchemist. All right, have a good day studying tomorrow and then do well on your open book quiz on day four. So that concludes all the videos then for lesson 15. So we're getting down to the end, only three more um, lessons left to complete this course. So keep at it, you'll get through.